This gets a little more complicated in a minute, but we'll, I'll, I'll show which I'll talk in a second. So typically when you talk to a CFO, and I think Chris Ellington mentioned it a couple of times, you will often hear uh, them say return on investment or ROI. And what is that? Well, there's two ways we can measure return on investment. One is a dollar way, and another is a percentage way. So let's assume that we're looking at uh, acquiring an MRI, and we get these cash flows. Where would these numbers come from? So what would the negative 1,500 be? If these are thousands of dollars. It's the purchase, the capital cost, the purchase price of the MRI, the installation cost. So where would the other numbers come from? Estimated cash flows. They're your estimated cash flows, that's true. They're your estimated net cash flows. So why do I make that qualification? Because it's inflows minus outflows. So it's revenues minus expenses. So you've got your capital cost is in year zero. We're going to, pick, we're going to write GE a check for $1.5 million to get an MRI in. And that MRI will then generate what? A series of cash inflows and a series of cash outflows. What will be the inflows? How do we get them? Reimbursement. Reimbursement. Okay. Revenues. What is revenue? What goes into the revenue? Where does that number come from? The visits. Price and quantity. The number of, great, so this is an MRI, so. Or the scans. The number of scans. And are all scans reimbursed the same? So all the scans by different types. Do all different, ty all different types of scans have the same level of reimbursement? So every type of scan will have a different reimbursement. Do all payers have the same reimbursement per type of scan? Mm -hmm. So you're going to have the revenue, the revenue from this MRI is very complicated. You've got all your different types <coughs> of scans, you've got all your different payer mixes, and you've got all your reimbursement per payer. Then, of course, you've got contractual allowances, discounts, and so on as well. So you end up with net revenue. Okay, now I claim it also generates a cash outflows. What will those be? Sorry? Maintenance. Maintenance. Repair and maintenance on the machine. Electricity. Electricity. MRIs use a lot of electricity. Payroll. Payroll. Tell me about that. Right, so the, the uh, radiological technicians, the receptionists, the billing staff, IT staff, everything that all the labor that's required to run the MRI. So yes, it's really easy for me to stick up these four numbers, but in fact there's a lot of work and assumptions that go behind those numbers. For now, we're just going to assume that they're right. So what do we have to do? <clears throat> well, we have the net capital cost of 1.5 million, which is in today's dollars, so that doesn't need to be discounted. And we're going to bring all the other cash flows back to zero, and we get a net present value of $78. So let's just talk about how Excel does that, and then I'll talk about the meaning of it. So we use the NPV function here. Again, the first thing we want to know is what's the interest rate. So it's, if that's a cell A2, which is 8%. Then it tells that it wants to know which cash flows are we going to discount. And I'm saying it's A4 to A7. And then on the outside of the equation, you can see I add in A3, negative 1,500. Why is that? Well, because when Bill Gates was writing this program, he decided that the first cash flow that would be discounted would be in year one. He did not build the NPV formula to take into account that there would be a cash outflow in today's dollars. So when you're doing this, from now till next May, remember the NPV formula requires you to put the initial investment on the outside of the formula. So all we're doing here is we're taking the 8%, we're discounting the 310 to 750 in, in cells A4 to A7, and then we're adding the negative 1500 because it's in today's dollars to the present value of the cash inflows. 
and we get $78. What is the meaning of that $78? Eight dollars is the return on investment of um, it, it's the amount that you're going to come out the positive from making the investment. Okay, positives. How many go a little further down that path? It's the amount at the at time zero. Uh, if you make this kind of investment with these future <coughs> returns, at time zero you will have um, the whole invest the investment as a whole is worth seventy eight. Exactly. What that $78 means is that the present value of the cash inflows exceeds the present value of the cash outflows by $78. If this was an investor-owned corporation, the value of the firm would go up by $78 if it made this investment. Any questions about that? Okay, so net present value um, is uh, the way we handle uneven cash flow streams. Now, the 10% I've just used as, as a discount rate, where does it come from? It is commonly called the opportunity cost of capital. Why is it called the opportunity cost of capital? What's the opportunity? Why, why, why is that word used? Have invested that money elsewhere. That's right, it's because if the organization invests the $1.5 million in the MRI, it foregoes the opportunity of investing it in another asset. So that is why it's called an opportunity cost. And I also mentioned here that it has to be of similar risk, because investing $1.5 million in MRI. What is the difference between that and investing 1.5 million in Florida swampland <laughs> or a hedge fund? The risk. How would you characterize those two investments? It's a little bit harder to project the uh, cash flows of the swamp. So that's the point, and we're going to talk more about this next week. But they have to be of similar risk. A hedge fund is a much riskier investment from a healthcare organization's point of view than an MRI. The cash flows are more predictable. So that's why we have to use opportunity costs of similar risk. So what we're going to do in this process is we're going to assess the risk in the cash flows. We're going to choose uh, alternative, identify alternative investments of similar risk, and then we're going to choose the opportunity cost based on that basis. So, the $78, as uh, I just mentioned a minute ago, meant that, the, that means that the value of the organization goes up by $78 if it makes that investment. So, a positive NPV means that the investment is expected to create value, and a negative NPV means that it's going to lose value. So, typically, healthcare organizations want to choose projects and investments, make resource allocation systems that have got positive NPVs even not-for-profits have to have NPV positive, more NPV projects than negative NPV projects. Much of the not-for-profit mission is meeting community need and so on, which is great, but you still have to, you cannot have only projects that meet community need that have got negative NPVs, because that is a way to bankruptcy. The second way of me measuring uh, ROI is percentage basis. And again, here we got exactly the same cash flows, minus 1,500, 310, 400, and so on. So the question we want to ask ourselves now is, what interest rate would make this a zero NPV project? 10%, it made it a positive NPV project. So what, what we're going to ask now is, what interest rate would make it a negative NPV project? And so you can see that the, eight, uh, the interest rate is 8%. Um, we highlight A3 to A7, and we come up with 10%. But 
that's the IRR function in Excel. And again, the interest rate guess is, is basically an older version of Excel. You don't really need the interest rate, but you can put the, all you have to do is highlight the A3 to A7, and that comes back with uh, a 10%. So what does that mean? Well, that's called the internal rate of return, the IRR function, or it's the ROI in percentage term. So in this case, it must be compared to the opportunity cost of capital. In this case, it's the IRR is 10% versus the cost of capital of 8%. So the fact that the IRR is greater than the cost of capital means what? What was that? That it's impossible to find the you should take. That's right. The fact that the IRR, the rate of return on this investment is 10%, and it's only costing us 8%, means that there's a 2% gain. That's a good project. So, IRR and NPV will always give the same result. If a, po if a project has a positive NPV, what can we say about IRR? higher than the cost of capital. It has to be. If an NPV is negative, the IRR has to be lower than the cost of capital. So the NPV and IRR will always give the same decision. It's just different ways of looking at it. Okay, uh, the next topic is intra-year compounding. And we have to talk about this in finance because many assets and many debt and many investments have got compounding periods other than annual. So bonds, we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about bonds because healthcare organizations are large <coughs> issuers of bonds. They typically pay, most bonds typically pay interest twice a year, semi-annual. Uh, Investor-owned organizations typically pay dividends quarterly. Uh, when you take out a bank loan, you typically make monthly payments or even weekly. All of these have got different compounding periods, and that requires a special adjustment to the, the, uh, the formula that we use to calculate present value or future value. So when we earn interest more frequently during the year, or we pay interest more frequently during the year, what does that do? Well, under uh, the future value of investment is larger. Why is that, just conceptually? If I'm going to compound semi-annually versus annually, why would that make a larger future value? Yeah. You're compounding the money more often, so you're getting that interest more often. Exactly. So when you're compounding semi-annually, you're earning interest on the interest more frequently. So anything that gives you money earlier will always be more valuable. On the other, on the other hand, the present value of an investment is smaller under in the annual compounding. So if you're going to take future cash flows and discount them by a semi-annual rate, that will reduce the PV. Because you're discounting more frequently, and the more frequently you discount, the greater the effect of the discounting on the, on the present value. So <clears throat> intra-year compounding results in two things. The future value is larger, the present value is smaller. It magnifies the effect of discounting and compounding. So just to get a quick example of what we mean here, uh, on the top timeline we have annual compounding. We receive $100 every year at 10%. We calculated a few minutes ago, it would be $133.10. Now we're going to have semi-annual compounding. So instead of getting $100 every year, we're going to get $50 every six months. And that results in $134.01, which is higher than $133.10. So you can see the arithmetic here. What's happening is, because you get the $50 faster than you do under annual compounding, you're earning interest on the interest you've received earlier. So the more frequently you compound, the faster the effects of compound. So now we've got different compounding periods, different interest rates. 
How do we make sense of all these? Well, one way to equate and to level the playing field so that we can compare different kinds of interest rates is to calculate the effective annual rate. That is the rate that causes the PV to grow at the same, to the same future value as under, under intra-year compound. So for example, let's suppose we've got 10% compounded semi-annual. If you do that, if you invest $100 uh, or $1 at 10% compounded semi-annually, at the end of the year, you will have $1.0025. So the effective annual rate is 10.25%. So if I were to offer you two investments, one that pays 10% compounded semi-annually, or one that offers 10.25% compounded annually, which would you prefer? They are the same. They have exactly the same financial value. 10% compounded semi-annually has exactly the same financial consequences as 10.25% compounded annually. You should be indifferent between those two options. Here are different examples. You've got 10% compounded annually is 10%. 10% compounded quarterly is 10.38%. 10% compounded monthly is 10.47%. And 10% compounded daily is 10.52%. So again, if I were to give you the choice between 10% compounded daily or 10.52% compounded annually, you should be indifferent. They have exactly the same financial value. So, Here's, how do we calculate those numbers? Well, there's a long way uh, in, in uh, the textbook uh, and in the chapter model, there's a long way of calculating it mathematically. Uh, fortunately, one good thing that Bill Gates did do is that he put an effect function in Excel. So all we do here is we say, we put in the uh, A2, we put in what is the annual rate of interest. Here it's 10%. And then the next thing we have, uh, the thing we want to know is how many compounding periods we so if there are four compounding periods, then the effect function is A2 and A3, and you get the 10.38%. So this is just a simple way of converting annual rates that are compounded within a year to an effective annual rate. So we talked about many different types of interest rates. We talked about three types. Let's just quickly review what they are. First is the stated or the nominal rate. Those two words are the same thing, stated or nominal. Nominal means named or stated. It's the rate that you see on the wall in the bank, the rate you see stated in contracts, 10%. The periodic rate is the stated rate divided by the number of compounding year periods per year. So if the stated rate is 10% compounded semi-annually, the periodic rate would be the 10 divided by 2, which is 5%. And then the effective annual rate is the same, the rate that under annual compounding would produce the same results. So let's uh, just to summarize those relationships I talked about. If the number of compounding periods is annual, so if there's only one compounding per year, life is simple. The annual rate equals the, 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 the periodic rate equals the stated rate equals the effective annual rate. They're all the same. However, if you've got intra-year compounding, the periodic rate has to be less than the stated rate, and that has to be less than the effective annual rate. Yeah. Could you go back to slide 29 for a sec? So does that say that for an annual rate of 10.5% is the same as a 10% daily rate? I'm saying if I give you two assets to two investments, one has 10% compounded daily, and the other one has 10.52% compounded annually. Okay. Those are exactly the same investments. Okay. So let's just go through a quick example of what I mean by that. We've got 10% compounded semi-annually. The periodic rate is the 10% divided by 2, which is 5%. The stated rate is 10%, and the effective annual rate is 10.25%. You can see here's this basic relationship. The periodic rate is less than the stated rate, 
which is less than the effective annual. 